really announce or talk about, so let's not waste time. I swear we had something awesome to talk about, but I'm sure we'll remember it after. Sure, okay. All right, so, now before we even actually start that, I should let you guys know that something that we've made a bit of a tradition with our MAGFest panel specifically is that um, just because we decide that we are happy to stay here and answer literally every question you guys feel like asking. Now, we don't have the room for like three or four hours, obviously, but at the end of the official time of this panel, we will go ahead and disperse. There's another room. But there is another room that they said that we can use. I think it's the forums room. The forums room. And if some of you guys wish to then leave and say that that's the end of the panel for you, then good, because that, that's totally fine. There are some great concerts and shows and stuff that you really shouldn't be missing. But if you really do feel like missing those great concerts and shows and stuff, then you can join us in the forums room and we'll stay until literally you guys are done asking us questions. It really doesn't matter. Like, last time I think we did it for five and a half hours. Yeah. And that's fine. I mean, this is the one thing we What else are we doing? <laughs> so, anyway, so, uh, how do we want to do this? We just want to do, like, Do we not have mics for over yeah. out there in the... Hey, there's like, there's oh, oh, there you go. excellent. Uh, are you just abandoning us to answer all the questions while you have around a mic? Hi. No. So the answer is no, that might help work. Shout it, go shout it. Alright, so, um, what? Uh, no, we're good. Do we have, I think we should just call on the person who's currently waving his hand to buy us time to figure out how we're going to do this. Sure, go for it. Okay, uh, two things. One, I don't know what I don't know if you guys are there, but, um, secondly, I do have a way around it.
so I have, I have a fellow to introduce in a moment. But first, Jesus, uh, the question was the resurgence of the Japanese industry, right? So we're going through a readjustment in the Japanese industry right now. There's a lot of things that uh, the Japanese industry is having to work through. Um, they had kept a static production method for a very long time. If you know anything about uh, Japanese game creation, or if you, if you know too much about Japanese game creation, very often they're thinking they just rebuild an engine for every single game as the American industry started to build uh, static engines that you reuse and come and understand, get expertise on, cut costs massively for us. Now that we have to build these gigantic games, you're seeing all sorts of problems with that production methodology. The Japanese industry is a little bit falling apart. They don't have the support infrastructure for the independent scene that we have here. But this is a good thing. I think the Japanese games industry will absolutely survive. There's just too much, there are too many culturally interesting things, there are too many people who have the skill set, who have talent. We've seen so many great things come out of that industry. But I think like in any period of readjustment, we're going to soon start seeing the Japanese industry really start to roll the dice, right? We've seen it with Nintendo before. Games keep fails, and they just put it on the Wii, on the DS. These were things that everybody was like, that's insane. Nobody's going to want to wag the stick. Who's going to play a handheld game on a touch? Come on, and then we have like iPad, blah, 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 iPads, and all these things. I think as the Japanese games industry is back more and more into the corner, we're going to see a willingness to take risks that we haven't seen from the Japanese industry in 15 years. And I think that's going to produce some amazing games. So that's the very long answer to your question. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself, or do you want me to do it? Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Davey. I'm sorry I have nothing to do with extra credits whatsoever. Other than that, I think it's an excellent show. Uh, I was the writer on The Stanley Parable. And... Thank you. I it's sweet and each and every word. And I wanted to grab Davey because if any of you guys have any questions about... You can only be here until 9-ish, but... 9-ish. Uh, i uh, uh, but if you have any questions about building an indie game or starting, you go for the first time out, throwing yourself at, at creating uh, a video game, uh, you, I mean, you've gone through this process. So, and all that comes with it. Yes. yes. Uh, and so, if there's anything, feel free to direct questions about indie development at Navy 2. If there's anything you want to know, uh, I will. Oh, we got a couple hands over there. I'm not going to go off of them. Okay, I saw sort of the second row head first, but then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, it seems like I'm doing a bit of a low drive with what is uh, probably my favorite commercial. Uh, I think it's some of the coolest things that's local games. I'm just going to explore Latin America along the way. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I was wondering how much you know, are there any other reasons that we uh, might want to so, question was, uh, I, I, see, I see you've been to some places recently, James. Is there any place that we should look out for for more global game stuff? Okay, so to be frank with you guys, one of the reasons I'm going to be very verbose today is because I'm tired. I get talking. Um, I just came from London. This is my always first time. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate this, Dan. Um, so, I just came from London. This is my first time in the States in seven months. Uh, I've been in Norway, Germany, France, England, Turkey, Greece, and the United Arab Emirates. And uh, a lot of that was for consulting work, some of it was for games for good work, and some of it was to explore these places. Um, I think that for places that we should look, be on the lookout for, obviously we all know China is an emerging market. I think we're going to see a lot now. The console ban has been lifted now, we're moving forward a little bit. Um, India is another one that we really should start looking at. Uh, we pay far too little really attention to Indian market with 30 people. Uh, surprisingly, the other two that I really want to talk about are Turkey. If any of you guys are launching like a free-to-play game or that and you want subscribers, it is so worth it to translate into Turkish. It's unbelievable. Thank you. Across the board, everyone I talked to, and then I went there, I checked it out, and 
they are mad for games. They just don't necessarily have the revenue to spend sixty dollars on a game outside of Istanbul. But uh, there is, I mean, that's why there's a huge like mall and Dota scene there. So Turkey is definitely a market for consumers. Um, it's possible. I need to spend more time there. Uh, the only developer I really found there, though, is uh, is the guy who made Mountain Blade. Actually, uh, the uh, other market is Poland. Poland is making unbelievable stuff, and for like six years now, we've outsourced everything to Poland. Right? Like they have unbelievably skilled developers, and we outsource to them because Poland is currently still cheap. But in Three to five years, the economy in Poland is going to be strong enough that you're going to see a lot more Polish developed internal games, and uh, they'll still be cheaper to produce than Western games because the average wage there is just low. Right? Um, but we've spent so long outsourcing to them that you just have people who are at least on par with the heavily skilled section of the AAA industry here. Because I saw Deer Esther and Radiator and thought I could I can do something in those engine in that engine which was free uh, and and literally the old like Source can do two things it can do empty it can do hallways and guns and that's it it doesn't do anything else and it's great for those two things I didn't know how to I, I didn't know how to do guns and I wasn't particularly interested so I was like hallways it is. Uh, <laughs> Go with the Genesis. That, that actually really was how it started. Uh, and, but you know, like, so, so honestly, like, that constraint was very specifically what had, what was like, okay, well, if I don't have the ability to do literally whatever I want, if I have this one thing, what am I going to do that's interesting with that one thing? What do I really care about? Like, where's this Venn diagram overlap between things I really care about and things I actually am technically capable of? And that cuts it way down, right? I mean, if you could do anything, you go crazy. I mean, I have been in that situation. Um, and like, now. sorry? I'm in it now. Yeah, exactly. And you know, Unity is like open worlds, right? And you can, there, there's such a vast, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm not, I haven't dug into Unity yet, but I'm kind of not looking forward to it. Uh, you know, just, just be, or I, I want to do it, but. Uh, the constraint of having to deal with something and like not being able to change that thing. Um, I mean, that's super, super valuable. And your engine may not provide those constraints, and it's probably a good thing in some ways that it doesn't, but um, that constraint has to come from somewhere, right? And it can come from your engine, or it can come from artificial constraints that you place on yourself for the engine, or it can come from something else. It can come from your teammates, it can come from a, an idea that someone gives you, Obviously, game jams. That's the whole idea. Working within this constraint, um, and, and I think from a from a design perspective, I, like as far as actually, you, your question was about picking an engine, and I tangented off into my own nonsense. Um, but always get better. But um, I've seen a lot of talk about how to get started in developing after you've made that choice, assuming that you have some sort of prior experience and are able to proceed. How do you start? You're, you're talking like in the great beginning of all things. Yes. You remember the first it, one. <laughs> it's so personal. It's so personal. It, you're gonna you're gonna make it, and then people are gonna ask you, and you're gonna be like, I don't know. Like it it it. Unfortunate. This is the unfortunate thing: is that the the point at which it clicks for you 
is going to it's going to be on something that is so contingent on your exact personal scenario and what matters to you that doesn't matter to anyone else the way that it matters to you. And no one likes to hear that answer. I mean, I've heard that answer from a billion different people, and I've never liked it. Well, I have the flip side of that answer. Um, so it doesn't matter, right? Don't sweat it. It doesn't matter if you're wrong, right? Try something, pick it, yeah. do something, and if it does, you don't like it, do something different, right? Don't worry about it. It's very easy to get hung up on that first moment where you've got that blank canvas, you have no idea what to do, just jump into the pool and you'll be fine. And ultimately these two answers are the same answer. It's true, yeah. right? Which is the weird paradox. <laughs> Alright, let's see, let's go. Uh, middle toward the back. Oh wow, that was specific, sir. <laughs> uh, yes, with the hand, uh, further back. <laughs> <laughs> So 
Uh, again, this is a voice that fits the character. Uh, but we have so many more questions for you. Okay, yes, moving on. Uh, uh, you sort of had it in the phone. That helps holding a thing up. I appreciate that. You're cold. <laughs> You're making everyone hold things up. Yes, I am. <laughs> It's day three of PAX, so we're all lucky to have our voice.
very interesting approach. A lot of good thinking there. There's a lot to learn about human devices in the future. But we're not there yet. I don't know if we need a steam machine with the price of computers today, right? Uh, you can get a machine for $500 which runs most of the games that you're going to want to play. Maybe not at the highest settings, but they'll run. Uh, do I need a separate box to run those same machines? That's a market question that I really don't know the answer to. And I'm a little bit skeptical about. So, Steve Machine's my answer. Um, kind of touching on what Dan said, uh, and I'm not sure if it was actually 2014, but it was recent. Uh, H1Z1 kind of changed their policies on the, the fly, and they actually did. For, uh, I think a whole day offered refunds if you contacted the company, which uh, I think that's kind of like a red flag that maybe you should reevaluate kind of an action before you change your opinion on a game. <laughs> uh, I, I had some, I had some like very, I was tossing out a few very specific examples that, of like games that didn't work for me, but I think that's. I, it was getting too negative in my head. So I don't want to. I don't want to come up here and spread the hate. It's love we got. Uh, so also the the thing that the thing that I think could that I thought was done very poorly in a lot of ways in the last year that I think could be used a lot better is Steam Early Access. Um, I think that yeah. Um, I I mean the number so like. Uh, you know how like several people will like unconnected people will say a thing to you, which means that you know it's actually happening to like millions of people. Uh, I heard so many people like the other developers say like, "Oh yeah, my game's going on Steam Early Access." Why? Oh, and it's like a lot for a lot of people it was money. Um, I don't think that's the right reason. I think that there is a compelling reason for it, and I think some people have have uh, used it for that compelling reason. I don't, I, having not done it, I don't think I'm, I'm a good judge of what is the compelling reason. But we've seen so many people who, uh, you know, not only um, not only put this thing out ahead of when it when it should be shown to anyone, but in doing so, they fracture the launch of their game. They're splitting their base up into two separate launches. Um, and I know many people who, you know, have like when the game actually like came time to launch, like didn't get the, the boost that it should have because why it's already out. You know, what are you talking about? Um, and that's in addition to a handful of things. But like I said, I haven't done it. Uh, I feel like there are a lot of ways that that it could be done better than it is. I just want to add a pick one other thing. My answer: Ubisoft's response to the Assassin's Creed uh, no female playable character debacle. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn both about what we should do in terms of gender quality of games and also about how to do PR. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, all right, let's do another one. Uh, uh, I have uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you raised your hand like way early on, and then I had to ask, called someone like right behind you. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. James and my approach to that, I think, would be very different because for James, it's oh, sorry. oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so the question was, uh, I don't, I, I, I don't know how many people have actually played the Stanley Parable, but there's, there's an ending. Right, well, well, for for not you people, uh, there's there's a section of the game where there is a like a literally a museum that um, that details many of the. Uh, the development uh, milestones that we actually went through and things that actually happened and changes to the game that were made and how certain things came to be. Um, and, uh, and that's, so the, the, the funny, the thing about it though is that it's not really, it's not like we were just like, hey, I want people to know about how, what, how the game was made. It was kind of like very intentionally there to, to like, pull you as a player out of the experience for a minute, and then actually after that you're like pulled very harshly back into the experience, and so it's not, it's not about like, 
just a specific piece of information, but more about the transition between states of how we receive information. You know, you're in a certain mindset where a piece of information, oh, it means this very particular thing to me. I'm in a very different mindset. Oh, this new piece of information means something totally different. And usually we think of like fiction and documentary as being, you know, separate things that don't, like they don't converge, you know, for the most part. And there are some, I mean, in film, I think a lot more than games, there's some very, very interesting films that blend that line and do a really fantastic job of making you kind of wonder where exactly, you know, like, am I, is this actually discussing something real? And I would say that, uh, in Stanley Parable, it was right to use, uh, not because it was more important that people know about how the Stanley Parable was made than other games, but because the Stanley Parable is about shifts in perceptual mindsets. Um, and so it was used, so it was used as a mechanism, as a tool for that uh, in particular. Um, which is not to say that it would be interesting to like also then have like a piece of downloadable content or some, I don't know, some just purely historical thing, which is, I, like, which I think is more interesting to you, maybe. Or I don't know, I'm speculating. So, I think to each game, how it preserves its history is a function of the game itself. The reason I liked that the Stanley Parable was because I felt it was appropriate for the game, but one of the things I really liked about the museum was actually the fact that it showed people that it didn't spring fully formed from their head. Yeah, right. I think that is actually super important, and uh, about how sort of piecemeal and um, barely held together in some ways these things really are, right? But in a great way, which is the same deconstruction that Stanley Parable itself does, which I I very much appreciate about it. So I think it was really appropriate for that game. I don't know if that particular approach would be appropriate for all games. I think there are many different ways of of looking at this, even if it's just making available online, every version in the version of history rather than the final version. Yeah, it, for us it suited the project, it was necessary. And the, actually the other interesting thing about that is that we filtered out, like there's a reason why the particular information is in that, that's in that room is in that room, is because we wanted to be revealing without spoiling stuff, so we were also in the service of the narrative, we were also in the service of we don't want to spoil if you happen to have not seen a piece of content by the time you get here. So again, the fiction also has a say in what's going on. It's not just purely you're here to receive information, it's like this information Information is in service of an emotional experience or whatever it is that you want to call what people do. <laughs> that's a good way. I really like to hear you have very much of a sentence. All right, let's see. Uh, we have a giant feather in the back. Oh, okay, I'll see with the giant feather. And you might have to speak up. very, very heavily in a lot of ways. Uh, what are some ways that this developers are finding to try to account for that, to make this new cool experience playable for the kinds of people who just aren't going to get sick in five minutes? And actually, I'm curious if you're if running into uh, a lot of devs who have been experimenting with it, trying to find solutions. Uh, yes, but before I talk about solutions, I will reiterate the thing that I said a lot. I am actually skeptical about our current iteration of our VR future because I have seen in my career VR come and go four or five times. And it's sort of always been like 3D movies where every 10 years 3D movies roll around and everybody's like, oh, they're the future. And it turns out they're a gimmick that are really good for some movies, but they're just not the thing I'm going to do for all movies all the time because they aren't the best solution. And until we get a, a space 
which we can walk around and be physically present in our VR world rather than just tilt our head, I don't think it's going to be this big shift. I mean, how many years now have we been talking about the Oculus Rift? And we still don't see it as, I mean, even making percentage inroads into how we build the Oculus Oh, Facebook has the dollars to throw at it to make it a, a solid reality. I hope someone solves some of the problems with it, but I don't, I'm a little bit skeptical still. That caveat aside, uh, I know, I've actually seen several companies hire people who are basically uh, virtual haptics experts or virtual kinetics experts, which translates to they understand things like motion sickness really well, and a lot of it is simply in keeping your camera and your head motion aligned. And so there's one of the things we found out early on, I'll just give one example so I can pass this along, is a lot of times in FPS, right, I can move my look with my mouse. If I can move my look with my mouse and with my head, I can start having very, very weird things go happen where I'm sort of simultaneously moving in two directions or my torso is actually twisted in game, my Indian character's torso is twisted while my uh, real life torso is not and my body freaks out. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of things that sort of block some of these things or eliminate your avatar, your virtual avatar entirely so that way you don't have the point of reference that your body doesn't understand. Uh, so there, there are steps being taken. They've also done a lot like refresh the, uh, up the refresh rate and the pixel density and all of these things which makes it substantially easier to have two screens this close to your face. So there, there is work being done, uh, but it's all small individual things. I think it will end up being an agglomeration of small individual things. I don't have much to say, but there is a, a sort of bias problem from developers where the more that you use, the, uh, like the Rift for example, the less likely you are to become nauseous by it, just like your body acclimates, and it's tough because if you're a developer, you've been using the thing so often, you don't get that motion sickness anymore, it becomes harder and harder to tell. Well, I mean, obviously you can bring people into play tests, but in actual development, you know, practice, uh, I know that's that's tricky because there starts to become a gulf between the developer and the player. I don't know how to solve that. All right, let's have another question. Uh, let's see, um... I'm so glad you have to pick an item. <laughs> uh, with the water bottle right here. Um, so extra history. Did you know that you guys Thank you, Mark. So we are a we have a So we have a we have a So we will be seeing more topics, uh, and I will not. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Um, so, extra history is in the 10K mark on that. A couple of things. Uh, we are currently exploring new artists for extra history. Uh, after Sigo Kujidai comes the South Seas Company. It will probably start hitting once a week. After South Seas Company, it takes some time to bring on a, a new artist, make them fit the art style, all this sort of thing. Uh, we will be seeing about the same length, anywhere from three to six episodes per topic, but we will be seeing more topics because we have a lot of history. Yes, and we're still figuring out some details, but it may also involve. Um, one thing I would like to do, and I don't know if it's possible, but I would like to have the um, artists. Rather than switching off episode by episode like do with extra credits, switching off series by series so that there's a bit of consistency to their look and their art style. Because I expect whoever we bring in for extra history, the other artist is going to bring a little bit of their own flair, just like David does to extra history. And I would love to be able to have them like have each series really feel like their own, like they own it. Uh, but since series can be of varying lengths, like uh, to go is going to be six parts and. Another one might just be three or two. Then that makes some weirdness there with scheduling. So we might start actually also creating and releasing little short one-offs now and then as well, just for a little quick, like a little quick. I mean, I guess I was going to do a little quick. Let's just jump into this. Sort of here, or just a small, tiny topic. 
contact us with love to. So some of them will be small things like if there's a particular battle that we think is really interesting or a particular day in the French Revolution, right? There's some stuff about uh, the States General that I think is fascinating to have one day that we have to say the single episode that doesn't make sense to you in the series. Uh, but the other thing that we'll also be doing is sort of why it matters, right? There's a lot of these topics that eventually, in the long term, if we were able to do this for 10 years, I would love to have a lot of series about things like uh, Roman history or whatever, but have those playlists start with something that explains why it's important, why we care about it today. So we might also do those as one-offs, uh, as to fill out between the artist's schedules. Yeah. We shall see, but yes, it's mix. But yeah, and we, thank we, you we again, by the way. Uh, yes, that is, it's unbelievable to me that like, so many people are so interested because just one thing to tell all of you, when we started this, we had everyone, we had people from all over telling us, you can't do that, if you put Instagram on the gaming channel, you're going to kill your channel. And we said, no, I don't think you know this audience. And we did it, right? Everybody will start a new channel, do something do it under a totally different name, if you're going to do it. Um, we said, no, I, I think you don't understand, there is a lot of overlap. You don't give enough credit to people who love games, right? And in the end, we see more views on an extra history than we do on an extra credits. So thank you again. Deal with every day, right? And so our ability to put that in the game 
is limited and we need to reach out. Part of it is we just need to reach out to the community that really understands what we got to represent. One, one game that actually just occurred to me, I think it's out. I, I, I hope it, like someone can maybe confirm, but there's a game for iPad called Pry. Um, and it's about a, uh, a war, it's, it's about a guy from, uh, in, or I, I think it's, he's in Afghanistan, whose uh, eyesight is destroyed by, it's, the game is very abstract. I mean, it's not about the day-to-day -day experiences of, of, you know, being blind in the way that I think Pulse was that the one that you sounded more like that was maybe a little bit more, but Pry is, is more of like an emotional exploration of if you didn't have, if you had like this faculty and then one day you lost it, what's the internal emotional experience of that like? Um, and I thought it was very well done and I think it's on the App Store right now. That's fascinating. I haven't actually heard of that, but I will have to check that out because I, I'm surprised yeah, I didn't that, that. That's why I'm wondering if maybe it isn't out and I accidentally played a preview build or something. So I, 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 can sh I should check or something to make sure that it is out, but I, I definitely recommend it. But on the other hand, one of the good things that comes with this is we talked about two games which are sort of imminent release, so we're starting to think about it. It's slow, maybe a long process, but at least we're starting to think about uh, other perspectives than the one that we've looked at for so long. Pride is out. Pride is out. Pride is out right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. Next up, uh, let's see. I see someone holding up a phone on this side. Yes, hello. for mobile, one of the main things you have to take in consideration is that most people are looking for application. And I feel like when designing, sometimes that goes against some of the other things I've learned watching your videos and also in Kama Sutra and all of that. So how, how would you balance this need for including application in games with, I don't know, like if I want to make an action game match with an RPG elements or something like that. But I need to have that negation, you know? So that kind of like is a constraint. How would you deal with that when in the mobile industry? That sounds like a good one for the designers. The question is basically like in the mobile space, since app negation is such a key part of the experience and that's what so many of that audience is looking for, like it, it's kind of a really big restriction if you're not wanting to necessarily make that a big part of your game. How do you, how do you work around that? How do you deal with that? So, for me, I would say that, first off, that's something that a lot of people are looking for. 
But you only care if your white really looking to do is hit 10 million people, right? 50 million people. You may not worry about that. You may hit the niche that doesn't want that. Um, or the times at which those people want something different. Uh, but you can also look at other things. World of Warcraft is in large part an application game as well. Uh, if you exclude certain waiting. Um, Facebook, the experience of Facebook itself for most people is an application experience. What was that? Uh, uh, so the experience of Facebook itself is an application experience for most people, the way most people use it. So there's lots of different ways that we provide this. And then if you really, really care, you can slide people away from that, right? You can start people at that point, get them invested, and then bring them towards more and more complex activities. Uh, but that's my thoughts. What about you guys? It, I, I, sorry, I, I feel like a wet rag. This is so not the like space that I, I operate in. I mean, for, for the most part, I'm, I'm, yeah. All right, good answer. All right. No, you said two. Okay, on this side, I see some sort of hat. I think it's a hat. Yeah, it's a hat. Uh, yeah, so he's asking what happened to Extra Remix and uh, Design Club. Uh, basically, they still happen just whenever I have time to uh, work on them. Like, Extra Remix is one that I enjoy doing, but it takes a lot of my time to do because it's basically me doing it solo. I write it, I voice it, I do all that editing. And uh, it's, I like doing it a lot, and I, there are, I have like a list of a dozen like artists that I want to get to for Extra Remix. Yeah, some of them are here. Some of them, like one of them is playing in thirty minutes. <laughs> like, uh, but um, yeah, some of them, some of them I've got to meet here for the first time. Some of them I met here at Magfest in previous years. It's, it's been awesome. I, I met the I don't know if he's in here now, but I met the guy who wrote our intro theme this weekend for the first oh, that's time. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I definitely want to continue that. And Design Club is also still continuing. Like the most recent one was the uh, Punch Out one, the animation one, which, uh, which yeah, again, one that I wrote myself because I'm the animator on the team. And that's really been the problem with Design Club, right? Uh, we've experimented with trying other designers, and we haven't really uh, settled on somebody who. My life's been super angry. I've had too much to do. Any of you guys watch James Redman know I do it in five minutes at three a.m. whenever I can find the time, right? And so, just finding someone to do Design Club, it's something that I would like to do periodically and jump in on. We just haven't really found the right writer for Design Club regularly either, or the right mix of people to periodically do new one. Yeah, and since we've obviously had to slide back on that, on making those weekly or bi-weekly type shows, I, I think I, we instead want to just focus on making them really polished and really, like, high production as, as good and as long as they need to be. Like the punch out one is a good bit longer than a lot of our er earlier ones, and I put a lot more time and effort into the editing and work on it. I just want to make them all nice and polished now if we're not going to be coming out with them all the time. Oh, but I do know exactly what I want to do next. Uh, how many of you guys play Baldur's Gate? Like the first one. <laughs> so if you remember Baldur's Gate well, do you guys remember Durlog's Tower? Yes. Durlog's Tower is one of the best dungeons I have ever seen design in the game. There's so much that's right about how they design it. Uh, and even where they're wrong, their experimentation is really interesting. So I wanted to do a deep deconstruction, like a multiple episode deconstruction of just Durlong's Tower. <laughs> we'll see what I get. <laughs> I want to probably enlist all of you for footage capture on that one. <laughs> so, okay, let's have another question here. Uh, let's see. Um, you and the Gator in the front. Um, this actually ties into uh, Design Club because I really love the uh, French Out episode. Thank you. Are we going to um, get any more on the animation of the games and what games recently have had really nice character animation in game that relays as much information as the Punch Out games did? And um, as an addition, as a uh, animator for games, um, how should I approach that kind of animation design in the type of strengths that I have making this game? Right on. So yeah, there will probably be more design club animation themed type episodes in the future. Basically, <coughs> as soon as I see a game that gets me like pumped enough to like, okay, I have to make an episode about this. 
because Punch Out for the Wii I had not even seen or played until like eight months ago. And then I was just furious that nobody had told me about this game. <laughs> so that was so cool. Because just the more I looked at it, the more impressed I was by it. But uh, yeah, I would love to make some more uh, animation game ones in the future. If I see a game that excites me enough, or I think about an animation issue that games have that I want to approach enough. Um, as for work, like working as an indie animator in games yourself, uh, do you work in like 2D sprite or 3D? Yeah, 2D sprite. Okay, now, I've not done a lot of 2D sprite stuff myself, and with I guess depending on the resolution, you're super limited in terms of expressiveness. I imagine you have to like work pretty broad to like hand take the emotion. Well, I mostly work in pixels that work in okay. more crisper. Uh, nice. Okay. Uh, and that can, like, what sort of games do you work on? Like, um, I did a game Sprites, sprites, sprites. Right. Lots of lots of game action. Yeah. Lots of stuff, so, yeah. Game. Okay. So, and especially uh, with games, it, for, making the shift from film for me has been a bit of a learning experience as well. Because there you have all the time in the world to come, like just it's only about performance, and that's all. It's not about like at the action that the characters have to do. But instead, I've found that you have to focus a lot more on putting the character into every single action you can, just in the timing of the jumps in the way they run, whether it's a really bouncy one, or they're trying to put character, like as much like you know those character walk cycles and exercises that students have to do all the time, where they have to try to like do just a walk that feels like someone interesting and unique, like basically doing that, trying to find the character in the way they move and interact around the space, like the way Rayman characters move around, like is super cartoony and bouncy and fun and like this really nice and peeled smooth and, uh, and like I think they've totally found a character that not only that the characters have but that the game has in that in that animation style that's just that kind of appeal. So I think that's definitely a thing they should for. And don't worry about taking a step to a left, right? Like whether it be Metal Slug or what happens to Mario when he dies, right? These really expressive, big, ridiculous moments. Depending on the game, but for a lot of games, uh, what seems a little bit too big for you in the action in the moment for the player is actually to read really well. Yeah, generally it seems like going broader is better than going subtler for the most part, especially in the game action and stuff. Are you familiar with the, the video called Juice It Up? Yes. Yeah, it's um, indie, two indie developers, two, uh, um, uh, one of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, sorry, <laughs> anyone from Scandinavia. Um, and, uh, and they, they did a talk, they took Pong and then said, how can we make this awesome without actually changing the game at all? And it's just animation and making it bigger. Like you said, I'd recommend it if you're interested in using small visual details to convey expression. I'm, I'm watching that. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, let's have another question here. On this side, some sort of gray box. That, that's the thing. How do you get into video game writing? I... So this is actually really good, because the question is, how do you get into video game writing? And I believe the depressing answer. And then do you want to give the less depressing answer? Sorry, you mean writing for games or about games? For games. Do, do you want to give me the less depressing answer to write about games? You can, all right, you you go first, and I'll do better. All right, so <laughs> uh, I can look at this. So, all right, uh, the problem is that we are writing for games. If you're talking about big AAA games, is something that there aren't often junior writer positions, right? A lot of times we. we take our designers and make them do a lot of that copywriting. Uh, a lot of times they hire people from outside the industry, people who have experience in comics or film or television. And there are not as many just writer positions in the end. It's more now than it used to be. Um, be prepared for the fact that, especially a lot of the, or your early writing positions, will be writing things like item descriptions, right? Uh, we'll be writing a lot of just 
instructional text and having a not writing world or story at all. Um, so no, there's a long way. On the other hand, there are a lot of paths now to get into writing for things outside the AAA space. And a lot of people I know have begun writing and often volunteer work, but for small indie companies, this sort of thing. And once they get a title or two under their belt, have started just calling themselves a writer and calling themselves a contractor and cold calling everybody, right? Start sending cards out to everybody, send resumes out to everybody. And all you need is one up and you're set. But it's not as straightforward as here's a linear path inside the industry that takes you through the title to the writer. Yeah, it's actually really, really messy. Um, and it's messy for everyone. I mean, even, it's not like artists have a, you know, thank God we have an established place in the video games industry, you know, it's all straightforward from there, right? So, I mean, it's already messy, it's just messier than uh, other other things. Um, like, th th this is one that as soon as you begin to, to parse it apart, like each of the pieces that you've picked apart then goes down into smaller and smaller sub-pieces, so I'll try to stay like as big a picture as I can. But um, a really important question is why do you want to be a writer? This is probably important for any, uh, any uh, craft, but I think for writing it's, it's very specifically important because there are not that many uh, currently available options. So if, you, if what you want is to write for the kind of thing that already exists, you need to be like dead on certain about that. Because what's not going to work is that you want to write really expressive and interesting stories, and so you try to go work at a big company because you're 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 doing less than no progress toward what you want to be doing. You're actually wasting time that you could be spending doing what you actually want to do, right? Because you're, but but maybe but maybe you do want to go work at that big company, right? Like James says, as soon as you do that, then there's process, right? Then there's not just the then there's not just the fact that I'm writing a story. There is politics, right? Then there is the structure of how you advance, and not just in the industry, but in this particular company that I'm trying to go to, right? And just raw persistence has a lot to do with it, because you don't know how most of those companies work, right? Because you haven't worked at them yet. Um, there's nothing like persistence. Um, persistence and, and, and honing in as much as you can on what do you want. And when you realize that you've been pursuing something you don't want, getting out. The, like, that is a, that's a trap, is you can end up trying to do something that you, you eventually you start to get this nagging feeling and you're like, something about this isn't right. But if you don't follow that feeling, again, you do less than no progress because you're wasting time. Um, and I mean, it's, it's also easy for me to get up here and say this because like I forewent all of that and I just made my own thing, right? Uh, and sometimes that works. Or rather, you know, to heck with words, sometimes it becomes like known and successful. If it's what you wanted to make, then it always works, right? And, and one way to guarantee that it works on that level is to make your own thing. Uh, but again, you're dealing with what do you really want? And if what you want is to be part of a system and a structure that makes sense, and writing your own thing often doesn't make sense, or often you don't have the resources to be able to do that, uh, I, I don't know, there's nothing like persistence and just brute forcing it until you figure out what you want. And I just wanted to add, by the way, read and live. There are too many writers who I've met in this industry, people who have ended up having to be writing for games, who the their whole life is video games and the video game industry, and they don't have a perspective beyond it. And this is why we get so many stories about Mark Snells, right? The most, uh, and they're more likely to read Star Wars fanfic, or uh, and not that there's anything wrong with it, right? Um, or hack fantasy than they are to go back and look at some of the timeless works that have stuck with us for a reason, right? Go dig into all that. Go dig into all the things that have resonated with humanity over centuries, and then go and have your life, have other experiences, get beyond the walls of games right now put around us, and bring that into your writing. Bring that in, because that will allow you to bring something new and different and personal. And if you do not have that new and different and personal thing, 
there is, there is no space, right? Because you already have those guys who can write your generic org sales story. All right, let's see if we get a few more questions in. Good answers, by the way. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, brother. <laughs> So I've got a couple of things. Um, <laughs> should we repeat the question? All right, all right, right. call. So uh, we have a fellow who's a computer science student who wants to make games, who wants to make games to help society. And so the question was sort of, how do I do that? What should I learn from this industry? But also, what can the world learn from this industry that may not be games themselves? And it may surprise a lot of you guys to know, but if you go back, watch the episode on engagement curve or interest curve. I'm going to go watch the Extra History episodes. All the Extra History, the first Extra History episodes were actually just an intellectual experiment on my part of whether or not I could apply interest curve to teaching history. And it seems to resonate with a fair number of people. But there's all these psychological things that we've learned from spending billions and billions of dollars trying to figure out how to engage a human being that we can immediately bring in and start applying to other aspects of our, of our life. And Read things like uh, Just Shell's Book of Lenses has a lot of really good, uh, broad pieces that we can bring in and uh, apply to anything. Uh, as far as making more socially impactful games, right now my honest suggestion to you is work with smaller companies or indie companies because they're more willing to take the risk on addressing these things. I don't think addressing these things is actually the risk that big AAA companies think it is. In fact, I think we need to expand our audience in order to support the budgets that AAA games now demand. But you're going to get a lot more progress a lot faster. Or the thing depends on Start making some stuff now. There's no reason why you're calling it Get it out there. Get people looking at it. Make sure your message is actually getting across. And just show it to people. If there's people who you respect and they can make games for you and games will be at large, try sending them a tweet, right? Just try saying, hey, oh, would you mind checking out my thing? Because we're not as unapproachable as it may seem from the outside. <laughs> well, there you go. Like, that, was, that was an excellent example. Have you seen Never Alone? I have. Um, there, was, there was an example of uh, people totally outside the games industry commissioning something to, and there are points of success and points of failure in there, right? Just you need that first step to try and show it. Got lots of people talking about a subject that they would never have otherwise been talking about for all the games. Merits and for all the games faults, right? Uh, but do you have any thoughts? Well, just very, very quickly. Uh, I think it's, it's important to note when talking about these things that you should really love making this thing, right? I mean, like, obviously we all want, we all want, you know, social progress and when we want to, to pursue uh, equal opportunity and, and rights and, and the ability to live for everyone. But if that isn't a subject that you're passionate about or if you're pursuing a subject inside of that that you're not passionate about, you literally may not have the energy to pursue it to the length where it will actually will make an impact for someone, right? And, and I think this is important, you know, like, I think it's important to consider, like, what, what, do, you, what do you want to do, right? Like, do you, do you do you really care about this? And I, I'm not implying that anyone making these things doesn't care about them, but I think it's just important to reiterate because when you do care about it, you'll go to the ends of the earth to make sure that that change actually happens. All right, now before, oh, we're gonna, so we are running out of time here, but here's what's gonna happen. We are going to, in a few minutes, walk over to the forums room, which is open, where they say that we can keep doing this as long as we want to. Anybody who wants to come in who has a question that we haven't answered, we're going to stay in there until you guys literally have nothing left to ask and you've all left. So, truth be told, by the way, I think when, when we've done this in the past, 
it gets way cool when we move to the forum room because there isn't this us sitting at a table, you guys are, because like, what is that, right? Like, our meetings are interactive, so too should all these things be. Let's just go sit in the circle and have a discussion, right? Let's just like talk. Yeah, <laughs>